Thanks for joining us. It's always nice to meet a guest that's got something to say and knows how to say it and is a businessman and a personality and a talent and a multimillionaire and a very clever man. John Myers, how are you? That's about six out of seven there. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> I won't tell you the one that was wrong. But it was <laughs> <laughs> what are you, first of all? Are you a personality and a talent, or are you a very shrewd businessman? Um, I'm probably a, uh, a businessman that l- likes to get on the air and muck about a bit and just, uh, you know, just chat about the stuff we like. You know, there's a, there's a real loss of personalities on the air right now. So when I go on, I just can't do this, you know, 40-second link. Uh, the reason is uh, I don't know what to say in 40 seconds. Uh, I can't do those, uh, what they call crunch and roll links. I'm not quite sure what it means, to be honest with you. Um, but I do links that will go on until they're finished. <laughs> you know, they're often more entertaining. <laughs> Let's go back to the beginning, because, I mean, you're one of nine. And where, where I feel an affinity with you is that you, you left school with virtually no qualifications, certainly no journalism degree or media degree or uh, TV presenting or anything like that. This is something you've crafted through your life. Has this ever been a problem for you? Um, it wasn't the problem getting into the BBC because they wanted someone who lived close who would do all the stuff they didn't want to do, like <laughs> reclaiming tape and uh, and going to OBs in uh, far-flung places of Cumbria that no one else wanted to go to. So I did all the shifts that nobody wanted. So no one asked me if I was qualified. They just said, thank God you're here. Um, but I, I never got a job by going for a BBC board because when I filled in the BBC board form that said, uh, put your qualifications down here, it was always blank. Um, so I, I never, I never got a job through a BBC board. I never got a job ever through a demo tape, um, which is amazing. So how did you get on, John? Well, um, I got on through really tenacity, hard work, and being uh, what I would say to all students these days is being annoyingly persistent. So I, I think that really helped, and also being thick-skinned enough that when people say you're not very good, is to remember it for about two seconds. And then, of course, there's a point where you go from gamekeeper turn poacher and poacher turn gamekeeper. Being the boss is an advantage because you've only got to tell yourself off. Yeah, well, actually, there's a very famous passage in the book where I talk about uh, when I went to Lord Century in the North East. And I went there as John Myers, as the managing director, and I thought, well, now's a good time to change my name because no one had ever heard of me. And I remember this guy in California called Robert W. Morgan. And he had this great jingle that used to go, um, it's ten past eight in the Morgan. I went, that's the man for me. <laughs> so I nicked his name and I launched on the air in, uh, as John Morgan. But I was also the managing director as John Myers. Now, I can actually recommend this to every budding broadcaster because people used to ring me to complain about me. And uh, <laughs> I used to answer my own complaints, you know. So I'd say to people, you know, what did he say this morning, look? I never heard it, but be assured you'll get a right bollocking. And, uh, and that used to placate them a lot, you know. The interesting thing about you was your timing. It was impeccable. And there's a certain serendipity with your career that you'd gone from being the talent and you'd built your persona on air and you'd got that in the bag. And then suddenly all these licenses became available. Do you agree that your timing was just perfect? Because if I wanted to do it today, there wouldn't be the licenses to get to be able to sell on. Yeah, I mean, timing is everything. So timing was good. Um, And I've also, throughout all of my career, always knew when was the right time to change. So I knew... Um, when it was the right time to move from Radio Cumbria. And that's when I was caught in the back of the BBC Land Rover with a lady in a compromising position. <laughs> I knew then my time was limited. That would so, be a sun headline these days, <laughs> wouldn't would it? be a sun headline. <laughs> I remember I, t- I took this young lady to, uh, in those days, it was, they were called um, transmission tests. So before you went out on an outside broadcast, the tech op would drive to this far-flung place in Cumbria and just make sure you can get a signal. And I took my new girlfriend there and uh, and I was waiting for base to come back and check they could get a signal and I did of course what all young lads do naturally and we were having a good conversation in the back and uh, they blurted out on the <laughs> squawk box hello John have we got it up yet <laughs> <laughs> and I had to confirm I did indeed and the, the signal was perfect <laughs> Uh, so you but could I, say you went from base to second base. So I went from base to second base. Well, I did the full rounders. <laughs> uh, so I went from that, and I thought, time to move on. So, um, But, you know, the, uh, so the timing was right. Then I went to Red Rose, which was, um, I, I said, I sent demo tapes. I never once got a job, um, you know, through a demo. And I sent it to a lovely man called Keith Macklin, sadly no longer with us. A wonderful man, but a terrible PD. 
and uh, I sent him the tape and he sent me it back and uh, to this day I always used to never allow my PDs to send letters back like this and he said dear John thank you so much indeed for your wonderful tape however you're not quite right for this, our station at the moment but we will keep your name on file that classic last line which <laughs> everyone knows of the file in the corner of the room with the called bid and so uh, I, I was so upset by it because I really wanted to work for Red Rose and um, I thought I'd better listen back to this tape just see where I'm going wrong you know so I listened back and it was a blank tape I'd actually sent the great <laughs> Keith Macklin a blank tape and then it dawned on me he hadn't even listened to it so <laughs> I rang him up to give him a right bollocking, you know, uh, about, you know, treating young people who want to get in the industry like this. And I rang him up when his PA was a lady called Innes Bracegirdle. And she clearly wasn't... That's a comedy name. That didn't exist, did no, it? No, that's why I remember her name. <laughs> I said, hello, Miss Bracegirdle. I went, sorry, am I through to Radio 4's <laughs> Comedy Club? Um, but anyway, that's a real name. Can you imagine? I wouldn't care if she married into that name. Can you imagine that? That would have been a deal breaker for me. Uh, but anyway, she um, she thought there's no way she's taking the blame for this, so she put me straight through to the legend that is Keith Macklin, who of course I had him on the ropes in the first two minutes, and he said, "Look, John, why don't you come down and see me?" I thought it's amazing, this isn't it? I wanted to get to this point of seeing him which is why I sent him the tape. But he was seeing me, not because I was any good, but because I'd sent him a blank tape. And so you're right, the timing was impeccable. And when I went down there, I wanted to play the hits. That's all I wanted to do. And yet the only job he gave me was presenting the country show. You know, that, that has followed me around my life forever. I can't get rid of it. So timing is everything. You're right. I want to talk to you about you being a manager because well, you were the first boss I had who was an inspiration. You don't mind taking the piss. You don't mind annoying other people. And I'd never come across a boss like that before you that sort of saw how silly the business is. You always sort of keep it in perspective, don't you? Yeah, listen, as I keep saying to people, we aren't doing open heart surgery here, right? Which is the title of the book. It's only radio. I used to say to people when they were all falling about, you know, it's a disaster. I used to say, will you all sober up? <laughs> it's only radio. <laughs> You know, no one's dying, for goodness sake. And I said, listen, we want to go out and we want to do the best radio we can do, right? But no one dies. So if we make a mistake, it's not good, but it's not a disaster. Um, and, you know, I, I used to read these self-help uh, publications. You know, they used to, used to buy everything, these management books. And let me save all of these listeners right now a fortune. They're rubbish. I mean, I read one which said that you can believe you can be anything you know well let me tell you if you i could believe right now <laughs> wonderful things but if you <laughs> collapse with a heart attack right now as much as i love you there's no way i could do open heart surgery on the cobble streets of nottingham so you know but what what the, what they were saying is is that if you have uh, positiveness is much better than being negative and i believe if you really believe you can then you usually will and so I used to go about saying, listen, it's fantastic being on the air. It's a real privilege to be on there. Enjoy it, you know, but no one's dying. So let's just keep it all into perspective. And so, uh, and I've also got this very low boredom threshold. And I used to go into meetings to say, what is the reason I am here in this meeting? Is it to make a decision? Uh, now, John, we want to uh, fill you in. I'll tell you, I'll come back when you need a decision because that's what my job means. I make decisions. I'm not here to chat. So, you know, you're right. I used to, um, I used to manage it well. I used to let managers get on with it. Um, I used to allow my stations to be slightly different, whether it was Scotland, Wales or whatever, you know, do it the way you think. And I wanted my managers to be entrepreneurial in the way that they did it. So, yes, you could all have the same name, you could all have the same ethos, but they were all slightly different, you know. And also, the best managers I had were all slightly barking mad. As an 18-year-old working for you, it seemed pretty simple what you did that you're now heralded for as a genius. I mean, Jeremy Vine talks about you in this book as the most powerful man in radio, and I think he's probably right. All you did was put good people on the radio, and they came. It's, it's really not that complicated, is it? No, it's not too difficult. The reason it's difficult is because most of the industry has a lot of dumb managers, right, who are often promoted above their competence, and then they're not given the power to make decisions, right? So there's a difference between managers and directors, right? Managers usually manage what they've been told to do, 
right? So, I mean, it's not everywhere, but that's usually the case. So program directors direct what's going on, but program managers often do what the directors told them to do. Now, the world is full of brands. You have to, it's like uh, Radio McDonald's. You know, you do it this way and that way. And I really fear for the loss of personalities. Now, that does not mean that radio is better or worse today than it was in the 70s or 80s. It just means it's different. And the people who are getting into radio today, this will be their golden years, as I'm sure in 20 years' time. They'll say, well, remember those days in 2012 when we all had to do this? You know, And there'll be some amazing stories. But what I'm saying is that the decade that I grew up in and, and the 30 years I've been in the industry, um, I, I wanted people on the air that I would personally like to listen to. And uh, even today, you know, I like most PDs, we skip the songs. I just want to hear what goes on between the records. And I used to say to my jocks, I don't mind you dropping a song. I used to drive people mad this. I used to say, John, we want to get 12 songs in. I said, no, hang on. The reason I'm paying that guy a fortune through the glass is I want him to say some things, you know, amuses. Now, if he drops the song, Phil Collins, and replaces it, say, with content that is unique because we've never heard it before. That's much better than a Phil Collins song, surely. There's a great responsibility with that, though. I remember when I worked for you, you said, feel free to drop the news if you've got a good enough call. But if you make the wrong choice, I'll fire you. There's an empowerment there, but there's also a threat, isn't there? You've got to get it right. There's a judgment. Yeah, I don't think you said I'd fire you. I think you might have said you'd get us to be a bollocking, you know. No, I think uh, you said you'd fire us. <laughs> did I? Well, probably your case, I was right. Um, no, but what it was, it was, it, was, it was saying to people, I had used to have this argument about news on the hour, right? And I used to get people say to me, John, you're a minute late on the news. I said, hang on a minute, my nine o'clock news is the nine o'clock news, whether it's at five past nine or nine o'clock, isn't it? I don't have any other news. The fact is, <laughs> I might put the nine o'clock news bulletin out at five past nine. Okay, as long as I tell the listener it's five past nine. So I used to come on and say, hey, we're a bit late with the news today. I'm really sorry about that. The world's crazy. You know, we're having a lot of fun this morning, but he's the nine o'clock news, but we're slightly late with it. The listeners get it. You know, I've never had a complaint ringing up going, well, that's outrageous, John. I missed the nine o'clock news this morning because you were one minute late. I've never had that complaint. What I've had complaints about is I was really enjoying that and you went for the news. I mean, the, I used to talk about, I was talking to this guy in BBC Local Radio. I says, what amazes me in BBC Local Radio, I could be listening to this really good debate. And suddenly the guy or the lady will say, oh, great, that's really interesting. Can you just hang on? We're going to go in for the traffic. I'm going, go for the traffic. And they'd go for the traffic. And the traffic guy would say, nothing happening today. But they'd still do 40 seconds, tell you that there's nothing happening. All I'm saying is, I wouldn't want to, be, to run that sort of radio station because I'd be bored. Heaven forbid anyone had put me on the air and said, right, John, you've got to do a 16-second link between these two songs because it's a crunch and roll. I wouldn't know how to do that sort of radio. That doesn't mean to say I'm past it. What it means is that when I'm on the air... And if I'm hiring presenters on the air, I want them to do certain things. Now, the, the absolute trick of a great PD is putting the right presenter in the right slot. Now, what usually happens is you can't have personality followed by personality. The Radio 2 do this brilliantly. They have Chris Evans, don't they, in the morning doing fantastic. And then the mid-morning guy comes on and he's got the uh, fabulous you know, music game and stuff like that. And very music intensive. Then you've got Jeremy Vine. And it's this ebb and flow of a radio station. And I actually think that you know, um, you could turn a radio station, no matter how badly it's performing, stick personalities on there, talk about the area you're talking about. And I used to th always think that successful radio stations were really successful if they gave the impression they couldn't give a toss what was happening outside of their area. The alternative opinion to that, though, and I've heard this before, is that if you bring people in who do big business for you, when they leave, you're fucked. Well, it is, but um, the fact is that all PD should have the person that they're going to put in that place, you know. I mean, take Scotty McClue. Scotty McClue was a phenomenon on the air, right? He was brilliant. But we all knew that that style of phoning would last three years in that market. Uh, you know, there's only too, too many times you can go on and say all single mothers should be housed in the Isle of Man. You know, which is his topic, you know, <laughs> one of his many topics. Everyone knew it was bonkers. So you have three years of this wonderful uh, entertaining phone-in. Then he'd move to another market and he'd go to another market. And that was great. But your job as PD is to think, well, who could replace him? And how do you evolve the radio station? Who'd ever thought, 
You take Terry Wogan at Radio 2, the greatest communicator of all time. Who would ever thought that Chris Evans would come on there and get a bigger audience than the great man himself? So it can be done.